Hello guys, I'm back with another video. Um, today's video is, oh my gosh, I have so much to unpack today. Where to begin, where to begin. Um, circular reasoning is one of the topics that I wanted to discuss. Um, we know that um, those of you who have followed um, the debates of evolution between creationists and evolutionists, um, Kent Hovind, he is... Um, one of the main people that I used to watch, and I still watch him just to debate um, against atheists or people who hold on to evolution. And it just reminded me of how all science, um, pseudoscience that is, how all pseudo pseudoscience has the same formula. They, they use circular reasoning, um, like with the radiometric dating. Okay, well, yeah, the rocks are dated by the fossils. And the fossils are dated by the rocks, you know, circular reasoning. And when he pointed that out, um, but this this is an article that was actually um, shows here June first, nineteen seventy seven. But we are still um, seeing the same type of fact finding um, in in science today. They are not changing their methods of how they date rocks and date fossils. They're still holding on to the circular reasoning. And this is a, um, a creationist uh, website, Inst Institute for Creation Research. But um, he's saying, you know, creationists have long insisted that the main evidence for evolution, the fossil record involves a serious case of circular reasoning. That is the fossil evidence that life has evolved from simple to complex forms from the geological ages depends on the geological ages of the specific rocks in which these fossils are found. And then it goes on, a significant development of recent years has been the fact that many evolutionary geologists are now also recognizing this problem. And then it says they no longer ignore it or pass it off with a sarcastic denial, but admit that it is a real problem which deserves a serious answer. But guess what? We still don't have a serious answer because today, as I said, they are still being trained the same way. The books have the same way of explaining how to date rocks and fossils through the circular reasoning method. Okay, now jump forward to um, today, which is what I am involved in, of course, the Flat Earth Movement, Flat Earth um, Truth, that the Earth is flat, stationary, fixed, immovable. Um, and versus, well, versus, of course, outer space. Outer space that we are spinning, we're tilted, we're spinning, we're racing through the, um, out, you know, through outer space towards the sun, and we're a part of the solar system and all that. Um, and the fact that we are told that, well, the, we're, the fact is that we're being told this, but it's not a fact, okay? We're told something that is a lie, that is an actual lie. We're told it as though it were a fact, which is, of course, that um, we have a vacuum, that space is a vacuum. So that made me start looking up words, and I just said, you know, okay. I, the first thing I did, I Googled, I said, well, what does gravity need in order to work? Because they tell us that the sun's gravity is pulling all the planets to itself, and it's, you know, holding everything in its place, um, keeping it at just the right distance to not be sucked in by the sun, keeping everything, you know, rotating around it because of its massive gravity. And of course, we, you know, all these planets, and including the sun, are all in a vacuum. A vacuum, right? So then I said, okay, well, let me just Google the question, what does gravity need in order to work? And it says forces of attraction. That pull is gravity at work. Every object in the universe that has mass exerts a gravitational pull or force. Let me enlarge this a bit. Um, pull force on every other mass. The size of the pull depends on the masses of the objects. Smaller planets have that have less mass may not be able to hold an atmosphere. 
smaller planets that have less mass may not be able to hold an atmosphere. So the sun's mass, along with all the other planets that are so much bigger than us, how in the world can Earth, which is a small planet compared to these huge, or, or you know, more huge planets, bigger planets, bigger planets, and the sun, which is massive, massive, I don't know how many times greater it's supposed to be than the Earth, but a lot bigger. How in the world can the Earth hold on to its atmosphere when it's right next to a vacuum, first of all, and then um, it's saying gravitational pull or force. The gravity of the sun may just simply just pull out, if I'm understanding this correctly, pull out the atmosphere of, of the Earth. So then I went back and I said, okay, well, so you're saying gravity needs mass. In, the, in other words, matter that has a mass. But guess what? What is everything surrounded by? The vacuum, right? Okay. I Googled, I said, well, what is the function of a vacuum in space and it came up okay vacuum space in which there is no matter or in which the pressure is so low that any particles in the space do not affect any processes being carried on there let's read this again space in which there is no matter no matter so if it has no matter how can we have mass? How can the gravity be working on it? How can gravity be working through it? Through this vacuum. How can it be working through the vacuum when we just read that gravity needs objects with mass or matter? They're saying that space has no matter, but then they have a caveat, or in which the pressure is so low that any particles in the space do not affect any processes being carried on there. So they're saying that even if there are little particles, it's not enough for the gravitational pull of the sun, I guess, to be even, uh, it's not big enough to work through the vacuum. There's not enough in the vacuum to make it work. Of course, you also have to understand that the planets, including the sun, are in the vacuum. I mean, they're in outer space. Space is the vacuum. So it's not like it, there is no matter if there are planets inside of the space. They're, they're more than likely, of course, talking about just the space in between the planets and the sun, which, once again, they're saying, well, space is, there's no matter there. So how can gravity, how can gravity be working through this space that has no matter? You have to be able to have some um, particles, something, um, an object that can, um, that has a mass to, to be able to make gravity work. That's what we just read. And they're saying that there is no matter, or the particles are so small that it has no um, effect, in a nutshell, on gravity. But yet, the sun's gravity is just pulling the Earth, pulling all the planets towards it, Anyways, despite the vacuum, despite the fact that, you know, the, the planets themselves have their own gravity, which, how can that, they, how can they work against the, the vacuum of space? How can they do that? Um, okay, the next one is, uh, 
I asked, okay, well, what is matter? What is matter? Oops. Let's zoom it out a bit. Um, okay, matter is a physical substance in general as distinct from mind and spirit. Um, and physics is that which occupies space, that which occupies space and possesses rest mass, especially as distinct from energy. Physical su substance in general as distinct from mind and spirit. In physics, that which occupies space. So it's what is occupying the space. What is occupying the space and possesses rest mass. So it has mass and it occupies space. Once again, what are the planets doing and what is the sun doing? I mean, aren't they occupying, aren't they in outer space? Aren't they occupying that space? They all have mass. They all have, they all, they all occupy the space and they all have mass. Yet, vacuum, space in which there is no matter, or in which the pressure is so low that any particles in the space do not affect any processes being carried on there. Any processes, such as uh, gravitational pull, attractions, movements, spinning, rotations, um, but dealing with pressure, for example, with pressure, uh, it's very uh, tricky because what we are noticing is that words are being redefined. The, the original meanings and examples, illustrations they would give for certain scientific words are literally being changed um, and updated, <laughs> updated. Um, every so often now. You just have to keep keep checking back because um, <clears throat> just as a vacuum, it was always, um, it has no air, no atmosphere, there, it's completely empty, void, no, nothing, no matter is out there. Um, now it means, oh, it's just a place that has a low pressure. So once again, when I went back to looking at pressure, they didn't really give clear examples. I had to actually type in the words, how is pressure formed? And then I got this answer, the rapid motion and collisions of molecules with the walls of the container causes pressure, which is force on a unit area. Pressure is proportional to the number of molecular collisions and the force of the collisions in a particular area. So once again, this is dealing with molecules against the walls. There are collisions with the walls of the container, and it causes this buildup of pressure. And that is coming from gas pressure from um, this Chemistry Libra texts website. But when I just look up air, I looked up air. I said, well, what is air? Because I know that our atmosphere as air, but what is in the air? Well, it says air is the general name for the mixture of gases that makes up the Earth's atmosphere. On the Earth, this gas is primarily nitrogen with oxygen, water vapor, argon, carbon dioxide, and many trace gases. There you go. But for some reason, even though the air or atmosphere contains all of these gases, it behaves differently than gases that are, let's say, in a pot of boiling water. And when the water, of course, gets hot, the steam rises, that's the gas, that that pressure is somehow different than the gas in the atmosphere. So they're saying that, oh, well, it does not need a container because the actual gases themselves, like the heavier gases, they form a barrier type uh, enclosure at the surface of the earth. The lighter gases are beneath it and it, the lighter gases are trying to uh, 
press against the, the heavier gases while being acted upon by the gravitational pull. That is their example for, for what is causing pressure. And so when you look at that and you look at um, definitions, how they are changing constantly and you have to keep um, searching it up again, researching it to see, oh, well, what is the definition today? What is the definition today? If this is not 1984, I don't know what it is. Meanings are changing. Words are changing. Meanings of words are changing and being exchanged for more and more lies. Then I started to look up things. I said, well, you know what? We're told about all this curvature that the earth has and we need to find out why in everything that we see as far as measuring devices, do they use things that are level? I mean, they actually use levels to make sure that things are flat, horizontal, on a plane, straight. And then I said, well, what are some things that measures curvature? And one of the things that measures curvature is called a spherometer. I think I'm pronouncing it right. Spherometer. And then it says a spherometer. That's a hard one. Spherometer is an instrument for the precise measurement of the radius of curvature of a sphere or a curved surface. It says originally these instruments were primarily used by opticians to measure the curvature of the surface of a lens. What I found very telling and, and very, very telling and very um, eye-opening is the fact how thorough these people are who, who just, you know, they have to lie about the spinning ball. Even when it has to do, this, this instrument was designed to basically, you know, they said that they measure lenses, um, things, you know, just small um, objects with the surface of a sphere. So the surface alone just has a spherical shape, like a lens or something. But they, the way they have to put it on the table and everything, they have to put it on a flat surface to, to measure it. But when I get down to this point, um, say, the distance. Um, okay, well, I think it was down here when it, it was alternative uses. And it says, um, all right, oh, get down to this point. All right, uh, so it says, since this uh, spherometer, I'm just going to say this instrument because it's easier to say okay I think I can do it since the since the spherometer is essentially a type of micrometer or micrometer okay and a micrometer is uh, known as a micrometer screw gauge device incorporating a calibrated screw okay you can read it later it can be employed for purposes other other than measuring the curvature of a spherical surface. Okay, now watch this. For example, for example, it can be used to measure the thickness of a thin plate. It can be used to measure the thickness of a thin plate. Oh, really, like something that's flat and round? Is that what you're saying? Flat and round? Interesting. It goes on to say, to do so, the instrument is placed on a perfectly level plane surface, and the screw turned until the point just touches. The exact instant when it does so is defined by a sudden diminution or diminution. Oh man, these are some big words of resistance, succeeded by a considerable increase. The divided head and scale are red. Da da da. Okay, I'm not going to read all into that because I'm not going to pretend like I understand the 
uh, mechanics of it all. But I did say I, it, it just stuck, stuck out. And it, and it struck me as odd that they would just go through all this. Oh, not only can we measure the curvature of a spherical surface, you know, like the Earth has a spherical surface, but it can also measure the thickness of a thin plate. And it says, and it's placed on a perfectly level plane surface. First thing I thought about was the flat Earth. They're basically saying, yeah, we have, we have tools out here that we can use for this ball earth, but um, they can also be used to measure areas that appear flat. <laughs> because it goes on to continue on, it says, um, similarly, the instrument can measure the depression in an otherwise flat plate. The method would be, okay, measuring the thickness of the plate, then it goes in here. This type of instrument is commonly used, commonly used in inspections of oil fill tool pipe for metal surface pits, fractures, and roundness before being shipped to drilling sites. So they're using this already on the flat earth, but they had to have a caveat in there to show, oh, even though it was designed, you know, to be measuring spherical surfaces, it can also be used for flat level planes as well. That's right. So that if you're trying to make a, make a correlation between this device and just the earth, the way the earth is shaped, then just know that it has a dual purpose. It can do both. It can measure spherical surfaces and level surfaces. Nothing to see here, folks. Ain't that something? I'm telling you, it's just they are constantly just trying to, well, they're putting it out here. But then they're saying it in a way that, like, okay, let me just, you know, they, they want to, um, you know, um, what is the word? They they want to um, make sure that they cover their tracks. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. They want to cover their tracks in all aspects of the science and of the math, and say, "Oh, well, if you're thinking, if you're if you're thinking anything about you know the Earth being flat, no, don't think that because this is a device that measures spherical surfaces." like the one that we're living on. However, it can be also used for this flat plane. You know, so gravity, does gravity um, work only when there is mass and there are objects with mass or matter? Okay, um, well then why is it saying that a vacuum has no matter? Especially when the planets and the sun are all in the vacuum of space. In, that is what space is, is the vacuum. So, these were just my thoughts for today. They're not perfect thoughts, I know. They're, they're very flawed because I'm not a scientific mind as far as just, you know, I mean, I know basic things, biology, chemistry, how things work in the natural world, but when you start to get to this level of theory and to me a psychological babble, it, I'm lost. So just trying to make sense out of it out loud and just sharing my thoughts with you for today. But that concludes this video and I do appreciate you all for tuning in, watching it, and supporting my channel. And please, as always, I ask for your comments. And the one, even the ones that are just, you know, I just want you to keep it clean, but you can definitely disagree with me. I try to respond to everyone, as many people as I possibly can, and I do enjoy your feedback, good or bad, mainly the good, though, so keep it clean, people. But until the next time, you have a blessed day, and you just go outside and you look around to see the truth in plain sight. Take care. Thank you, Howard. I don't have to tell you things are bad. Everybody knows things are bad. It's a depression. Everybody's out of work or scared of losing their job. The dollar buys a nickel's worth. Banks are going bust. Shopkeepers keep a gun under the counter.
Punks are running wild in the street, and there's nobody anywhere who seems to know what to do, and there's no end to it. We know the air is unfit to breathe, and our food is unfit to eat. We sit watching our TVs while some local newscaster tells us that today we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. We know things are bad, worse than bad. They're crazy. It's like everything everywhere is going crazy, so we don't go out anymore. We sit in the house, and slowly the world we're living in is getting smaller, and all we say is, please, at least leave us alone in our living rooms. Let me have my toaster and my TV and my steel-belted radios, and I won't say anything. Just leave us alone. Well, I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to get mad. I don't want you to protest. I don't want you to write. I don't want you to write to your congressman because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. My life has value. So, I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore!